we're going to calculate another example using the invariant, one in which we use the invariant to estimate the mass of the Z boson. The Z boson is a carrier of the weak force, much like the photon is for the electromagnetic force. It's somewhat different from the photon, however, in the sense that it's very massive. It weighs approximately 90 proton masses, and it's unstable. It decays so quickly, in fact, that no one's actually directly observed it. Instead, experimenters usually look for the products of it that it decays into. One can readily produce Z bosons in a number of particle accelerators, but in one case, they were produced with collisions of protons and antiprotons, such as at Fermilab. When I was a graduate student, I was asked to look for events of this type. One would see a collision of two protons making a Z, and the, the, Z, the Z quickly decayed uh, on the order of 10 to the minus 24 seconds or so into a positron and an electron. The positron is an antiparticle of the electron. One day I found an unusual event and I brought it to my professor uh, with the following description. There were two particles, the electron and positron, that had energies on the order of 260 or 290 GeV. And in the polar coordinate system of our experiment, they had azimuthal angles phi 1 and phi 2 and theta 1 and theta 2. And I was very excited because I thought I found something unusual. The question is, what's the unusual thing about the event that I had seen? And is it, in fact, a Z boson? We're going to again solve uh, for the mass of the Z that I saw using the idea of invariance. But before I move on to that, I want to show you a little bit about how one produces and detects these Z bosons. Z bosons are produced at Fermilab, which is a, has a particle accelerator called the Tevatron. It produces protons up to 1,000 GeV and antiprotons up to 1,000 GeV. So the antiprotons might circulate in the magnetic field of the accelerator in one direction, the protons in the opposite direction, and then they are brought in to collide it on one another. The collision products are detected by this thing called the collider detector at Fermilab which is where an experiment I worked on when I was a graduate student. In this experiment, the protons would come in along one direction to the center of that detector. The antiprotons would come in from the other direction. And things like the positron and the electron from the, the decay of the Z boson that was produced would come flying out through the detector in a couple different orientations. So polar angle here refers to the direction with respect to the proton beam and azimuthal angle refers to uh, angle around the cylindrical geometry. Just to give you a sense of what this experiment looked like, this is a picture of the apparatus. Um, you can see it's a cylindrical structure, uh, and if you notice, there's a person standing right next to the detector. It's quite large. Okay, so now we can solve for this uh, mass of this particle that I observed. So we'll take a couple different frames uh, in which to view the, the process. Let's take the lab frame after the decay. In this frame, there's the electron and positron, and they're flying out away from the collision with their respective energies and vector momenta. And there's also the center momentum frame of the, the, the rest frame of the Z before the decay occurred. In this frame, there's just a Z boson by itself at rest. In the lab frame, we're going to have two energies and two momenta, and in the center momentum frame, we just have a four vector constructed for the Z boson itself, which is its energy, comma, its momentum. It's at zero momentum, so that last term is zero. And its energy, therefore, is just its mass. If we construct the invariant in the center momentum frame, that's E squared minus P squared, but P is zero. And so the invariant is just MZ squared. The invariant in the lab frame will be e squared minus p squared as well. And here we have to sum together uh, to find the total energy. It's e1 plus e2 for the two particles. And we have to sum together the total vector momentum, p1 and p2. We can square out the, the expression for the lab frame. When I square out the energies, it's e1 squared plus e2 squared plus 2 times their product. And then when we square out the uh, square of the, the sum of momentum, it's p1 squared 
p2 squared minus twice their dot product. Notice that there's a sum of two things here, well, there's a difference, e1 squared minus p1 squared, that's just the mass of one of the electrons, and so I put it right there, and the same for e2, the positron has the same mass as the electron, and so these uh, terms gather together to give twice the product of the energies plus the, the mass squared of the electron. I still have twice, minus twice the dot product over here. The dot product of two vectors is just the product of their x components plus the product of the y components plus the product of the z components. And I'm going to leave it as a not very interesting exercise to uh, think about how to cast this in polar coordinates. That's not really the point of my uh, sample problem here. But I'm going to just tell you that uh, that can be found relatively easily. Um, it's twice the product of the momenta, product of sines times the cosine of the different azimuths, plus the uh, product of cosines of the polar angles. But that's just casting uh, rectilinear coordinates px, py, pz into polar coordinates. In this case, the electron mass is very small. It weighs about a half of an MeV, and these energies that we are detecting are many, many GeV, or giga electron volts. And so I'm going to ignore the electron mass in any further calculation, and I'm going to approximate that P is roughly equal to E for these electrons, because the mass is so small compared to the momentum. In this case, I can pull out uh, energies in front of the very front of this entire expression, and I have twice the product of the energies, 1 minus sine 1, sine theta 1, sine theta 2, cosine delta phi, minus cosine theta 1, cosine theta 2. If we use some of the numbers from the previous page, this mass works out to be about 516 GeV. That was pretty surprising for me, since most Z bosons are 91 GeV. And I'd asked my professor if, in fact, I discovered a new particle because I found such a heavy thing that was decaying to a pair of electron and positron. Most C bosons look like this. In fact, this is a sample data set from the CDF experiment where I worked on. And here are several thousand, well, actually many, many tens of thousands of decays of electron and positron coming from a Z boson. And you can see that they centrally val uh, are located at a value of about 91 GeV. But it turns out what I've observed, this 516 GeV object, is an old fact which we'll learning, be learning about soon, and that's related to something called the uncertainty principle. The fact that the Z boson decays, which means it's uncertain in its lifetime, leads to uncertainty in its mass, which is a form of energy. And as a result, see, some Z bosons will be produced that are very heavy, some that are produced are very light, and some that are produced are just right at the central value. You can already see it here because not every Z boson is exactly at 91 GeV. There's a spread of energies around here. And that's literally because not all Z bosons have exactly the same mass due to their finite lifetime. In fact, all unstable particles have this property. And in fact, with more data observed over subsequent years, since, since the years I was on, a, on as a graduate student on this experiment, here's a sample of many millions of Z bosons recorded at the CDF experiment. Most of them are piled up at this peak. And you notice that the, the value of the peak is like 10 to the fifth events are down here below 100 GeV. But then some of them extend far, far out, way beyond 100 GeV, out now as far as 700 GeV. And this solid curve, in fact, is a theoretical expectation for what that curve should look like, taking into account the uncertainty principle. The blue and green are various backgrounds that are in the experiment that can't be factored out. But what I had discovered was something that was very basic quantum mechanics that we'll be learning about soon enough. But I use my relativity in order to make that discovery.